All right, guys, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I think, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center. Um, it is a huge pleasure uh, to have Graham Robertson here today uh, to give an occasional seminar at the Jordan Center on building autocracy from above and below, emotional engagement and politics after Crimea. Uh, Graham is a professor of political science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He has a BA from Oxford University um, and an MA from Harvard and his PhD from Columbia. He's a specialist in comparative politics. Many of you have read his work on protest uh, in the former Soviet Union, and I know that because I assigned it to you to read. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's got a new book that's going to be coming out next fall, based on next spring, sorry, that's going to be called On Thin Ice. Uh, it's going to be co-authored with Sam Green, who also has done work on protest with some of their newer work. It'll have some of the social media stuff in it, but also a lot of the survey data that Graham's been doing with um, Sparks, which he'll be talking a little bit about today. So, um, and we're, since it's a, it's a nice sized crowd, feel free to interrupt with questions when Whenever you'd like, and you know we can make it a little more informal uh, seminar type style, but we can also go, go straight through and do Q and A at the end. Anyway, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to have Graham here. So I'll turn it over. I'm really looking forward to the talk. Thanks a lot for inviting me to come. It's a real pleasure to be here. This is work uh, that, as, as Josh said, is with Sam Green at, at King's College uh, in London. Um, it's a series of, of different papers um, that we are putting together. Uh, for a, what's hopefully going to be a, a, a book with a wider appeal than just a kind of academic audience. Um, that's a new experience for, for me. So um, having spent all this time learning how to write academic text, I'm now trying to unlearn how to write that, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's fun. But the book will be out next year. Um, what I want to talk about today is part of that. I can also talk about the rest of it uh, if, you're, if, anyone, if anyone is interested. Um, but the, the, the sort of the main uh, story that I want to talk about today is um, how we went from a situation uh, in 2011 uh, when uh, Putin was, was uh, really under pressure for the first time since he took office in 2000, uh, when there was mass protests on the streets, especially of the, of the capital and some of the other big cities, uh, and Putin's popularity, which had been really sliding for a couple of years, um, was, was at uh, what has turned out to be the lowest that it has reached so far in, the, in, the, uh, in his period as, as president, um, to radically turning things around and being you know, loved, as I'll, as I'll, as I'll, as I'll show you, but, but um, really, again, the kind of focus of everything in Russian politics. So it's kind of like a redemption of the dictator, uh, redemption of the autocrat story. And, and, and what I want to talk to you about is how uh, that happened. But we saw um, around uh, 24, uh, 2014 um, in uh, response to, uh, I'm going to talk about it as though it's in response to Crimea, but it's actually really in response to a whole series of events around the Ukrainian crisis, um, the, uh, the, the revolution, the overthrow of, of, uh, and flight of, of Viktor Yanukovych, uh, the uh, very swift action um, that the Russians then took to annex uh, Crimea, have a referendum, integrate Crimea into the Russian Federation, and then uh, support for rebels uh, in the east of, of Ukraine. And what you see is a couple of things about, about Putin's approval rating. One is that it soared very, very quickly, almost overnight really, in a matter of a couple of months, um, from, 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 from very low levels to, to really, you know, at least for, com for com in comparative context, extremely high levels. Uh, it stayed very, very high, basically oscillating somewhere between 60 and the mid 80s. Did any of the other Yeltsin's other prime ministers have those kind of approval shocks when they first took over? Was that like was he already unique in that? Because that's pre-president, right? He doesn't become yeah. president until April. So, or is it all? Is do you think it's all just about like he's announced on December 31st as the heir apparent, and then? So the, 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 there's a pretty steady rise from from August. So it's not just a one. It's not right. just a one night bump. But no, that's definitely unique. That's not. There, there's no. That, that's certainly. You know, I don't think Sharon Beard's popularity was ever <laughs> in these kind of stratospheric levels. But we never saw him like going from not to yeah, thirty up to yeah. not no. Um, uh, and what's really remarkable is how, how high it stays for, for 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 throughout this whole period. And then you start to see a, a sort of steady decline um, from from two thousand and eight. Down to you know, kind of around the the the, 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 the election crisis and the mobilization of, of the end of uh, 2011, 2012. Now, of course, with the annexation of Crimea, you get this huge jump up in, in popularity. And lots of people have studied this jump in popularity. Lots of people have talked about this rally around the flag effect. I'm going to do something slightly different from that uh, today. I'm going to talk about a much broader uh, set of phenomena. 
um, that are not just about popularity, but, but a much broader sense of people's well-being um, and, and vast improvements in that well-being that, that, that was experienced by Russians uh, during this period. One of the sort of data points for, that, that you see in this, in this case is this other question of where do you think of the direction that the country's been going in. Um, for much of the post-Soviet period, uh, the majority of the population thought that the country was going in the wrong direction. Um, so basically the whole of the, of the, of the, of the 1990s. Um, and then, you know, for, for Putin's first term and second term, jumping around a fair bit with then a kind of majority thinking things are going better. Uh, the blue is the right direction, the red is the wrong direction in the, in the second half of the 2000s. And then those lines came together and Russian society was really divided as to where uh, as, to, as to the, the kind of the future of, of the direction of politics in the country. All comes Crimea and you get this massive switch at, which has been sustained where the, 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 the proportion of people who think the country is going in the right direction is, is, is about 50%, so it's, it's a majority. Um, and what's interesting about this is this is basically despite uh, considerable economic stagnation. Um, so what you see is you know, the, the, the old story, Putin's popularity is due to uh, economic growth, which is very high. This is, this is GDP growth rate, um, or bank numbers year on year change. Um, throughout the 2000s, the growth rate is averaging over 6%. That's really nice. It, your, uh, your economy doubles in size over this period. And then you get the global financial crisis and you get this huge uh, drop off. And then the recovery from the financial crisis is, 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 is anemic, uh, essentially. And that's, that's the period in which Putin's popularity starts to flow downwards. It goes back up. Despite the fact that we re-enter recession in, 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 in 2015, and it stays up despite that. So this long period of the association between economic growth and popularity, economic growth and people's sense of well-being uh, gets disrupted uh, around this time. Now, this is a, this is a puzzle for scholars of, of Russia, but it's, a, it's also a wider puzzle for scholars of authoritarianism. Do you trust the methodology? The the surveys. Yeah, there's there's been a bunch of different ways of people have, have, have used, using uh, uh, list experiments and different ways people have kind of dug into those numbers. Um, and those were Levada numbers. The Levada Center is I've worked with them a lot. They're 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 really good. And they're you know to the extent that. But they're now considered foreign agents. So. Right, but they still continue to work, and, and I don't think the quality of their of their numbers has really okay. has really changed. Um, there was a, I mean it's it's a it's a valid question. People have been worried about that. Um, but uh, you know, people worry about social acceptability bias. Do we do we all just say stuff now? Um, but there's pretty good evidence that, that there's that there's not much of that going on. I think it's a small proportion, but 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 but, but not a, not a whole lot. Um, fun, fun little story about that is that uh, this list experiment that was done to try to measure uh, whether or not the Putin popularity numbers. There was one sort of rigorous right. list experiment done. And that ended up with uh, Scott Gelbach and I being on um, Donald Trump's campaign website because uh, Pollock back fact checked Trump when he claimed that Putin was actually popular and that uh, a bunch of academics, American academics, it wasn't just Russians, it was a bunch of Americans who said this. And it was one of the few times during the campaign that fact check showed that Trump was telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they said was a Monday Gate post I wrote with, about what Scott's research that he had done with Tim Fry and we were on the Trump website. Oh, so don't blame, the, the, don't, don't blame the Russians for <laughs> <Russian laughs> Trump's victory. Blame Tucker. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so true story. Anyway. Um, so in Russia, there's been this. This is this. This kind of disconnect between economics and politics is really interesting for for scholars of, of authoritarianism in general. Most of our theories of uh, authoritarianism rely very heavily on these pocketbook um, uh, explanations, either pocket individual economic well-being or sociotropic, so society's well-being, um, or the availability of resources for patronage distribution. So we would all expect an economic decline, such as Russia has witnessed over really what's now getting on for a decade, um, to be a serious problem. And it's not, right? At least in terms of the popularity numbers and the approval numbers and the sense of, what, of the direction of the country's going, um, these things have become very majorly uncoupled from one another. This also throws on the head tons of literature on Russia. Where, this, where, where materialist explanations of Putin's popularity has been the central um, explanation from, for the last 20 years, essentially. So I want to provide you with a different kind of story today that, that I think explains a lot of what's been going on. And that story comes from, uh, from political psychology rather than a kind of 
uh, materialist version of, 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 of the way the world is. Lots of recent work in political behavior and political psychology, uh, much of it focused on the United States, but um, uh, in other countries too, has shown that um, individuals assess their situation, they assess their context, they assess their, 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 their politics and their behaviors very differently from one another, even once you control for economic factors. That, that there's interpretations of the world around you that are pretty fundamental, that some, in some senses predate politics, um, that really are very, very important in understanding um, political behavior and political attitudes. Uh, and this has been a really big kind of trend in uh, the study of political behavior in the democracies. Right? It used to be important also in the study of political uh, behavior in autocracies, right? So the early literature on authoritarianism, whether uh, Adorno, Adorno's work at, at Berkeley on authoritarian personality, uh, or Arendt's work uh, on totalitarianism also played, uh, placed a really heavy emphasis on psychological aspects. Um, but we sort of forgot about that uh, with the behavioral revolution and when the behavioral revolution kind of hit uh, the study of authoritarian regimes and we've settled down into uh, uh, a rut, if you like, of, of, of materialist or rationalist explanations. Um, and I want to sort of push back on, 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 on some of that today and offer a different Different kind of uh, different kind of an account. Even the, if you think of Timur Karan's work, for example, Timur Karan's work is probably the closest thing in mainstream political science uh, of authoritarianism that that takes psychology seriously, right? So he has this argument about uh, pluralistic ignorance, and it depends on what you know about other people, and then about and, and, and people's thresholds for uh, discomfort with their internal and their external behavior. That's become really, really popular. But I mean, dominant story, I think. Uh, one could say in explaining regime dynamics uh, in political science. It's sort of psycholo psychology in feel, right? Um, but it's not based on psychology. It's not based on the scientific study of psychology in any kind of meaningful way. It's not connected up with any literature of psychology. So we haven't really taken this uh, angle seriously in a mainstream way for, 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 for a long time. Um, now, if you want to study authoritarianism from a psychological perspective, there's tons of different things one could do. One of the things that Sam and I do is we look at uh, research on personality types and the relationship between individuals' personalities uh, and the their, their regime around them and the context they find themselves in. This has become very popular in the study of, uh, of American politics, of Trump uh, in particular, but also in the study of, of European politics. And Sam and I have an article in, in, in CPS last year in which we look at personality traits and how they shape support for, uh, for the Putin regime. That's not what I'm going to do today. I'm happy to talk about that later if anyone's interested. But another uh, part of um, the sort of the psychology of politics um, that's been neglected very much in, 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 in the study of authoritarianism, I think, is the study of emotions. And so what I want to talk about today is research on emotions and what we're doing to try and understand the importance of emotions, the importance of uh, um, this other aspect to how people interact with their environment, how they understand their context, uh, and what it means for, for politics. So there is some work on emotions. There's kind of a, a growing, there's a really big emotional turn in general, I think, in political science. There's lots of work on emotions in American politics, uh, lots of work on, on emotions in, in European politics, and some work on emotions in, in autocracy. But so far, it's focused mostly on fear. So the idea that people are scared, and so they, so they behave in different, so they, they lie to, to survey uh, uh, questions, right, because they're afraid. There's a really nice dissertation at, uh, out of Columbia by uh, by Young last year, um, looking at fear in, in Zimbabwe and how um, the different extent to which people like, express fear and ex experience fear shapes their attitudes to the regime. Um, and there's been some work, uh, Wendy Perlman had a, had a great article uh, back in, in Perspectives in Politics in, in, in 2013, looking at emotions, both positive and negative, in uh, either mobilizing or demobilizing social movements, anti-regime opposition uh, social movements. So this work that's been existed so far is either based on fear or it's focusing on the, the opposition. We come at it from a, from a different perspective. We come at it from the observation driven by the Russian case, but not at all only about the Russian case, but with the observation that lots and lots of authoritarian rulers or, or, or quasi-authoritarian rulers, you think of Orban in Hungary, uh, in the world today are actually really popular, right? Um, and people are not afraid of them, but they're supportive of them. They're energized by them, right? Um, 
And so we want to try and understand that process and how that works. Right? That's, that's the, 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 the essence of it. And so what we're doing is going to study positive emotions, not as a way of reacting against authoritarianism, but as bolstering authoritarianism and what uh, is the, is the, what's, what's going on there. Our story is um, today that I'm going to talk is, is about is is really a story of the relationship between emotions and um, what Durkheim called collective effervescence. Right? Durkheim uh, studied the uh, importance of uh, participation in religious ritual, collective participation in forging identities uh, amongst people who were part of the same uh, religious grouping or sect. Right? and made an argument that it was this collective participation that formed uh, their identities. We take that basic argument, which was really a small group argument about, about, about physical nearness, um, and expand it for the, 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 the digital, digital age, essentially, for the, 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 the mediatized age. And we argue that um, the experience of participating on social media or on television in an event or experiencing an event, a political event through, uh, through either social media or television can create the, the, a sense of, a similar sense of actual participation. Right? People feel um, that once they see something on TV, once they've talked about it with their friends, um, once they've read about it, once they've got engaged with it, that somehow they were actually involved in the event. There's some really nice work on the, uh, on the Ferguson, Missouri riots uh, in the US experience about, about people's sense of of having actually been there when they weren't actually there at all, they were they were sitting in their in their homes uh, engaging with other people on on, on on social media. This sense of collective participation, we argue, can create a a, a, a feeling of collective euphoria, a feeling of collective um, uh, belonging. Um, what Yuval Feinstein argues is in in, in a really nice paper uh, in 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 in. in uh, uh, sociology journal whose name I forget right now um, uh, on uh, participation in uh, on how Israelis feel about the war with the Palestinians with um, what, what he calls a war that feels good right? a kind of collective sense of uh, identity of mutual affirmation that comes from mediatized participation uh, in, 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 in an event right? this helps to create community amongst the people who experience it it makes them feel linked to their, to their leaders, to their rulers, um, uh, who organize the event. And it generates broad, positive, emotional uh, connections that have wide-ranging effects. And so what I want to show to you today, uh, essentially, is how that process of participation creates positive emotional identification, and then what are the implications of those positive emotional uh, identifications. And specifically, what I'm going to argue is um, that the more engaged respondents are in our survey, I'll we'll talk about the survey in a minute, um, the more engaged people are in the collective processes of politics, the more positive emotional engagement they feel. And the more positive emotions are experienced, the more their support for the regime will increase and the more their general sense of well-being uh, is enhanced. Right? That's the, 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 the basic argument um, that I want to try and convince you of uh, this afternoon. To do this, we're going to focus on this Crimean experience that I started with. Um, Putin returns to the Kremlin amid protests and dissent. Um, he then quite deliberately, in the context of economic decline, shifts uh, the, the basis of his re regime, shifts the, um, the language of the regime to be much more about uh, social conservatism, much more about what we call wedge issues, right? It, questions of identity, whether there are issues of uh, uh, homophobia or issues of anti-migrant sentiment um, or issues of, of, of belonging to the Orthodox Church and you can see this in the in the television coverage and the, and the, and the media over the, the years that, that follow Putin's rest, restoration or return to the Kremlin. Um, into that context you come, uh, comes the, the Ukrainian crisis um, when that turns towards us and them dichotomies, uh, a, a, a discourse of patriotism um, of normalcy, of normal, good-thinking Russians, healthy forces against Western, effete, unhealthy forces, um, really becomes absolutely central to uh, the media environment in Russia. 
the amount of media coverage of news and, 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 the, and the, the, the war related events shoots through the roof. The number of hours on television, people's engagement with that, with those hours really increases a lot over time. Um, the coverage itself is highly emotional and highly dramatic. Right? Um, and so this is the context in which we see, uh, this is the empirical context in which we're going to look at this period of collective effervescence and um, a huge increase in collective well-being. The data I'm going to show you is based on a survey that, I, that, that, that Sam and I conducted. We've been doing a number of these over the years. Um, in Russia, these are online surveys um, of educated uh, middle and upper income Russians in big cities who use the internet. They're online surveys, so if you're not using the internet, you're not online. Um, the original idea is, as Josh referred to them as, uh, earlier on, as, 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 as sparks. Um, we started just surveying people like this in 2011 around the protests. Um, which uh, were seen as, as basically urban middle class protests. And uh, we came up with this concept of socially and politically active Russian citizens. So somehow it's sort of the market for political mobilization, socially and politically active Russian citizens, sparks, right? Um, and we, we wanted to study essentially the, the political dynamics within this group, because um, we thought they were you know, really the, 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 the playing field on which politics was, was being waged, right? Uh, at the time. So we've done a bunch of surveys. Uh, this particular survey we took uh, in October 2013. Um, so this is post Bolotnaya, post Pussy Riot, and post the, the anti-gay legislation that was passed. So this was at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of Putin's conservative values, or well into uh, Putin's conservative values campaign. We, had, we got 1,200 respondents um, from, a, from a marketing panel, essentially, of 350,000 Russians. We randomly invited people to, to respond to the survey. Uh, and then um, basically once we had balance on, on or population balance on, on gender and, and, and age, um, we, we closed, the, closed it down after we got 1,200 respondents. We then went back again and we interviewed the very same individuals after Crimea. So in July of 2014, post Crimea, post conflict in Ukraine, but before the, the shooting down of the Malaysian airline. Um, so that's the context. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a panel designed before and after. And of, a, of a very particular group of Russians, a group that has more opposition people um, than the population at large, fewer regime supporters than the population at large, um, uh, and is, 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 a, is be a little bit better educated and a little bit better off, and is urban. Um, and what we see is, from the before and after picture, lots and lots of really interesting changes. I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, data now that to show you the transformation of this group not just in terms of approval, but in its relationship to, 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 to the regime, in, in, in particular on the world in general, over this time. Um, so the first set of data is, is about presidential approval. Um, okay, so the, the, the light blue, <laughs> which you can't see at all on this screen, um, uh, is, the, is the after picture, right? And the dark blue is before. And essentially what you see is that, um, Bef the, before Crimea, of this, this group of, of, of sparks, of only about 51% of them actually approved of, 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 of Putin, right? Um, which is much lower than the general population where approval at this point was, was in the high, the high 60s. Right? After Crimea, I showed you before, the, Putin, the popularity in the general population is, is about 80, mid 80s. Uh, in our group, it is too, it goes up to 80%. Um, so what you see is the, this, the switch from this much more um, mixed group of, of citizens into being a much more unified, much more like the rest of the population uh, as a whole. We asked them the, 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 the classic hypothetical voting question, who would you vote for after this election on Sunday? Um, and you can't see that at all here. I uh, should have checked this before. No. But essentially what you see is you see a, the, so before this is, would you vote for Putin or would you do something else? And most of our sparks would do something else. Only 30% of them said they would vote for Putin. Most of them said they would abstain. Some of them said they would vote for other candidates. Um, after the election, and you'll have to take my word for it, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the Putin vote went up with over 50%. It was about 52%. And 42% said they would do something else. In other words, they switched to being exactly like the rest of the, of the national uh, sample. But it's not just approval, and it's not just voting. It goes much deeper than that. right? And that's what I'm going to talk about next. And fortunately, we have some number you can see. <laughs> So we asked people in October, the dark blue, um, what do you think of uh, how Russia is governed today? 
how proud does that make you feel, right, on a scale of one to seven? And the answer was, not at all, right? <laughs> Only some 15% of people expressed any pride at all in, of, of this group, expressed any pride at all in the way Russia was governed uh, before Crimea. After Crimea, this goes up to, to fully, what's that, 30, 35, nearly 40%. Right? So the proportion of people that are expressing pride uh, in Putin uh, increases dramatically. You get this, this like, marked uh, shift across in, in pride. We also asked them, you know, when you think of Russian Russia leaders today, what, to what extent do you trust them? Again, a seven-point seven scale. And again, basically, you know, more than 60%, or roughly 60% of the population don't trust them at all. Uh, and again, only somewhere in the region of about 25% express any trust towards their leadership before Crimea. And after Crimea, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a huge change. Right? You end up with almost half of the population expressing trust in their, in their leadership. Same with hope. We asked them, when you think of the way Russia is governed today, does that give you hope for the future? Right? There was not much hope going around somewhere in the region of the low 20s percentage before uh, Crimea. And then after Crimea, um, that's up to nearly 50%. People with some expressing at least some kind of hope uh, uh, for the future based on how uh, the country is governed. Right? It's a really, really major transformation, not just in approval, but in people's emotional connection uh, with the leadership specifically. Graham, yeah. have you looked, tried to look at, like, say, the similar analogous opinion in the United States before and after the invasion of Iraq in 91? Like, how much of this is just like, there's just a panoply of stuff that goes with getting into a war and winning something, and, and you know, you can tap into any of this, but if you ask one of 30 questions, you'll see they all shifted in a positive way. So that's what, that's the, I, I don't know what the American results were. I don't, I, don't, I haven't seen anyone ask these kinds of questions because we've been very focused on just this approval rating. So that I'll talk about this a, a little bit later. But the this is typically framed in this rally around the flag kind of context, and what we care is about about, about in that context is approval ratings, right. or what we have cared about. Because I was just thinking the exact same thing, except I was thinking of the 2003 invasion, uh -huh. and I googled it and it says 72% uh, of Americans support war against Iraq. Right. So Bush's approval went to like 71, 72 percent. Yeah. And it stays high for about six months or so, and, right. then, and then it goes down. Because right? there was resistance in the Crimea, there wasn't. Yeah. Well, because it goes badly, right? The, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and, and the politicians have an interest in criticizing Bush after. We can talk about, about why it goes down uh, later. I think that's actually I, important. I guess my question is just like you're saying here, look, it's not just approval went up, pride went up, yeah. feeling good about the country, feeling hopeful went up. And my question is like, are, can you point us to instances where there's rally around the flag effects where approval goes up, but pride and feeling good about the country and those things don't go up? Like, is this just... Right. No, I, I can't because I don't think people have, to my knowledge, and people have not really looked at it this way uh, before. And it really, it, I mean, it is exactly what you say, right? So it's not just approval. It's not just emotional engagement. We ask people, how serious a problem is corruption? It's high-level corruption, right? And um, you're, so you can say it's not serious, it's quite serious, or it's very serious. This is before Crimea. Um, but after Crimea, the proportion goes up from about 35 to nearly 50 percent. You see, corruption at a high level is not really a serious problem in Russia. This is the best improvement in corruption probably in Russian history in the annexation of Crimea. Um, we asked them about low-level corruption, so this is corruption that people might actually experience uh, on the streets. Has that gotten any better? Uh, and again, you have this very big drop off. But 50 percent of people thought it was a very serious problem before Crimea, uh, and that's down to the low 30s. Uh, after Crimea, so again, you get this transformation. Um, you get a transformation in how do you expect the Russian economy to perform over the next three years, right? So is it going to get worse? Is it going to stay the same? Is it going to get better? The numbers that think it's going to stay the same roughly uh, are, are, are the same, but you get a big drop off uh, in the percentage of people who think it's going to get worse. But nearly, again, about nearly 15 percentage points, right? So you get this transformation in the expectations uh, about the, the, the present, you get transformation in expectations about the future, and you get transportation, transformation in, in, in reported experiences of the past. Right? So we ask people, how did your family fare in the economic changes since perestroika? It turns out the invasion of Crimea makes the, makes the 90s better. Not, 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 not as much better as it does for corruption, but at least, at least somewhat. Right? So these are people whose own perceptions of their own experience changed really quite significantly over this, this period. Right? Clearly not 
to do with anything that actually changed, right? Clearly a function of this, 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 this process. Right? So the argument we're going to make, but it doesn't happen to everybody, is the other thing, right? So there's variation across individuals and the extent to which this, this happens. And the argument that we're going to make is what explains this change in emotional engagement, right? What explains this emotional improvement? Um, and I'm going to argue that it's greater participation in the collective experience of Crimea is what leads to these changes in the emotions. And then I'm going to show you that it's this changing in emotions that then matters and changes uh, people's uh, attitudes to, the, to, the, to the, the rest of their environment. Right? And this has consequences. To do that, we're going to do it in two stages. I'm going to first show you that participation shapes the increase in positive emotional engagement. And then I'm going to show you how positive emotions me mediate the effects on other outcomes. Right? So there's a two-stage uh, empirical strategy. We're going to measure participation in the collective experience in three ways. Uh, we're going to look at how much people watch state television. Right? So we have a, a five-category indicator ranging from you watch state television for news, I should say, um, every day. Um, and then you know, uh, several times a week, once a week, once a month, never, right? Those are the, the, the categories. We're going to ask people how interested they are in politics, uh, how closely they follow politics. This is a, 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 a four-point scale, if I remember rightly. Um, and then we ask them how often they engage in political discussion. And the political discussion is an index of, we ask five questions, how often do you engage in political discussion with your family, with your friends, with coworkers, with neighbors, uh, and on social media? Um, it doesn't matter much which one of those you pick, but so we put them all together. Uh, in, a, in an index. So that's going to be our, our, our independent variables for the first stage. And then our dependent variables for the first stage is these different positive emotions, pride, hope, uh, and trust. And we put them together into what we call the positive emotions index, right? Um, this is a, has an alpha, chromatic alpha of about 0.93. They're, they they move together, as Josh was, was suggesting, right, very closely. So I put them all together in one, in one index. Um, all right, so the empirics. There's a couple of different ways that one can look at these time series cross section, these, these sort of this panel data. Right? Um, uh, so the first way to look at it is to use what's called a static store, static score model, or a cross lag reg regression, where you basically use the values of your independent variables in the first round to predict uh, the values in the, in, of, of your of your dependent variable in the second round, controlling for the dependent variable in the first round, right? So, uh, but, so across what's called cross lag regressions. These are limited dependent variables, so we use Tobit models, so that are centered on both sides. And we control for nationalism, voting behavior, partisanship, uh, the economic sector that people work in, gender, age, education, Moscow, uh, or not Moscow, and, and people's financial uh, 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 level, whether they're which, you know, how, how, how wealthy they are, essentially. Um, and if you do all that, then what you find is that you have substantial uh, and, 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 and significant effects um, of how much state TV you watch, how interested you are in politics, and how much you're engaged in political discussion uh, on our emotions indicator, right? So if you go from one standard deviation below the mean on state TV consumption, that's kind of People watch state TV a lot, right? So this is, this is not a huge change. It's seriously roughly changing from watching state TV a few times a week to watching it every day. Um, you go up on, a, on, a, on our seven point scale, you've got basically about half a standard deviation um, on, the, on the emotions index, on the positive emotions index. So one, two standard deviation change in state TV gives you a half standard deviation change uh, in uh, positive emotions. Slightly bigger effects for, for political interest uh, same, the same difference, one, two stand, one standard deviation below to one above uh, gives you nearly a standard deviation change in political interest and then political discussion increases also we will talk about politics more are more likely to experience this increase in uh, emotional engagement so that's one way to do it, right? so okay. yeah. the scale of the dependent variable is from it, 1 to 7 1 to 7 yeah. um, an alternative way to do it, you might be worried in this context that, that the initial levels uh, of these variables are you know, endogenous to something else, right? So you, you want to, to think about that. What we do is uh, we basically do a difference in difference model or um, 
a fixed individual level fixed effects model is how, is how I actually run it. Time series cross section, this is an OLS regression, same controls. Um, and so we're looking at the change in, in state TV watching, the change in following politics and the change in discussion politics uh, on the change in the, in the, in the emotional uh, engagement indicator. And again, we find um, pretty substantial and, and statistically significant effects for all of those uh, three uh, variables. There's actually quite a big change in following politics and a big change in discussion of politics. The change in, 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 in watching state TV between the two waves is, is, is quite a bit smaller. Um, as I said before, even before coming up, people watched it a lot. The other things that seem to matter um, is people's family economic situation. So people who are doing better economically, they also increase their emotional engagement with the regime more than, than, than others. So the materialist story we've always told ourselves about Russian politics is not crazy. So that, that's sort of a relief, I think. That there's, still, there's still some kind of materialism going on. Marx is not dead yet. But, um, there's still something there. Um, nationalism also, also matters. People who were more nationalistic before uh, Crimea or become more nationalistic, sorry, over the period, they also uh, experience um, uh, greater emotional engagement. Uh, once you put everything together in one regression, you find that the only the state TV doesn't really matter so much anymore, but, they have, but political discussion and um, uh, interest in politics, so like that engagement with politics is really, really important. So the increase in emotional engagement is, mu is, is, is much larger, is substantially larger for people who uh, are actually you know, consuming more politics, who are more into this collective uh, moment around, around Crimea. So what? Well, in the second stage, what we show is that the positive emotions, the increase in positive emotions, has a big effect on the wider perceived well-being right, that, that I showed you earlier on. And that uh, participation is, for the most part, mediated by the positive emotions. Right? So it's not that watching state TV directly so much makes you uh, think the world is a better place, although there is actually an effect of that. But the part of that effect goes through the increase in, um, in emotions. To do this, we do a mediation model uh, uh, using the MEDEF um, uh, program. Um, and we estimate both the effect, the, the effect of emotions once you've taken all, all, all the controls and then the effect, the direct and, and, and the immediate effect of, 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 of our uh, state TV interest and, and discussion variables. And what we find is that um, even in, in the setting, uh, a lot of the increase in approval or avoiding or the improvement in corruption perceptions or perceptions of the economic future um, are driven just by emotions. They're not really accountable for by state TV interest or discussion. That each of these matters for, so as you see, the blue squares are the statistically significant, uh, uh, 0.95. Um, uh, all the effects are, are, are more or less in the, in the anticipated direction. But you find, for example, if you look at uh, corruption perceptions, um, there, there's a really big effect of, 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 of uh, uh, improved emotions on, um, if, on, on high level corruption. The, the perception of high level corruption goes down. There's some effect of watching more state TV on attitudes towards corruption, but it's only, it's only as mediated by, uh, by emotions. Uh, there's some effect uh, of more interest in politics, but again, only as mediated by emotions. And there's some effect uh, of discussion, but again, only as mediated by uh, emotions, right? Uh, only on approval and voting is there a direct effect uh, on, on in, in the direction we would, we would have expected. This is a direct effect, but in the, in the wrong direction. So if you watch more state TV, um, for your, your impressions of low-level corruption actually go up for some reason that I don't understand at all. Um, but the net effect is still negative because of the indirect effects through 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 emotions. Right? So you have this um, this, this emotional. Uh, engagement matters in and of itself, right? It's not just that, oh, well, it goes up with approval and we don't really need it for the explanation. It's doing something different um, from approval. Uh, and it's, it's, more, it's more important for these broader uh, considerations than, than, than even just the, 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 the participation variables themselves. I've been talking long enough, so I'll wrap up. Um, but essentially what I wanted to show you what I wanted to show you today was that what happens in Crimea is, or during the Crimean process, is we get this really big increase in popularity, even amongst those who were most critical of Putin before, right? So that's kind of the, 
simple lesson number one. These uh, our sparks, our socially and politically active Russian urbanites, um, become just like everybody else. Right? So the idea that the Putin regime is based on lower class and, and, and rural people or, or people from small provincial cities is not actually accurate after Crimea. Um, we show that all this approval goes up, but even more importantly, you have this big increase in emotional engagement with the regime. Um, Putin was before was popular, but not loved. And after Crimea, I'm not wouldn't necessarily say he's loved, but he's certainly much more trusted. Um, people have a lot more pride in Putin, and, and he makes them feel pride uh, more than they did before. Um, and he gives them hope for the future in a way that they absolutely didn't before Crimea. Right. So there's a real change in the relationship uh, and the identity of uh, the regime. Those effects are most marked are really amongst those who participate most in the Crimean moment, those who watch it on television, um, those who talk about it with their friends, uh, those who spend time reading about it, who are, who are interested in, 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 in engaging with it. There is both a big increase in those phenomena and that in itself has a big increase, uh, leads to a big increase in, 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 in emotion. So there's this sort of collective effervescence, collective euphoria. Um, process going on, and that collective euphoria has pretty significant implications for a bunch of other uh, assessments of um, how people uh, understand the regime they're living in and their relationship to it. Um, in the book, we go on and make a much bigger argument about um, how this should be different, how this should change, this, this kind of data should, evidence should change the way we think about autocracy. Um, finish just talking about that for, for, for a minute or two. Essentially, our models of aut autocratic regimes um, are either materialist um, and or very top down in general, right? So it's all about manip manipulation of the media, it's all about manipulation of institutions, uh, it's often about repression and force. Um, but what some of this evidence I think leads us to, to think of is, is a, a situation where yes, all of those things are true, but they also have they elicit a response in society. Um, and they elicit a response in society from particular kinds of people who are more, more interested and engaged. Um, that, is, that it's not just a simple one-way street where the regime beats people over the head uh, until it gets the answer it wants. Right? There is actually a collective uh, emotional uh, engagement in this process that comes from below and that interacts with the politics that are coming from above. And so authoritarianism in Russia today, and I think it's probably fair to say in Hungary, um, and uh, 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 Venezuela is another place that comes to mind, um, are, are really co-constructed by the interaction between the state and parts of uh, the society in which, with which the state uh, interacts. Um, and with that, I look forward to questions. skeptical of surveys, sure. I'm sort of, I mean, there's a lot of people making arguments about symbolic politics as being important to authoritarianism, like Valerie Sperling's argument. Yep. You know, certainly masculinity has been a big part of Putin's popularity and the emotional connections. And so I kind of wonder if you, like, what's so interesting about this is you're making an argument about symbolic politics using survey data. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, in essence, you aren't undermining the use of survey data, right? If people's emotions are so affected that they're kind of like, oh my god, let me just be more positive now, does that mean that survey data isn't, it's, it's I'm just puzzled by the, sure. the, the, the mixing of these things, and, I, and, and, and not quite sure I'm persuaded. Uh -huh. And then it, it leads me to be more skeptical about survey data. So is it is the problem that you don't think we can measure we measure emotions by surveys? Like I can't ask you questions about pride and, and you, you can't give me meaningful answers. I'm just I, I'm never sure what surveys actually measure. Right. And 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 that I do think that a lot of people think about authoritarianism in terms of emotions. Yeah. Um, so and my, then my you're speaking to a different audience that doesn't think about emotions because most surveys people don't think they're me they're measuring emotions. Yeah. They think they're measuring something else. So it's a, like a, there's yeah. a lot. I mean, it could be very, it could be great, right? Because you're you're making me like. So this puzzle. is I I I mean I I from experience can tell you that it is a challenge to try and bridge these communities because uh, like you say like the people who who believe in symbolic politics are skeptical of surveys. People who believe in surveys are skeptical of 
symbolic politics, right? And what we're trying to, my version of this would be, this is not the best way to study emotions if you're just interested in emotions, but if you want to connect that story up with other things like material version of the story and try and build a, a, a picture, a composite picture, then one way that you can study it that probably understates the role of emotions still is through surveys. And even if we're under, under, underestimating the size of the, of the emotional effect, we're finding it, right? And so it's, so I would think this is a conservative interpretation of how important uh, emotions and symbolic politics really are. Um, so that would be my pitch. Um, and so it's not that, I mean, I, th I think it, what I think is meaningful, um, you know, if, 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 if it was completely random what people said when you asked them questions about emotions, then we shouldn't really find anything, right? The fact that we find results that, that, that make sense um, and the fact that we're, that we're consistent across these different emotions, um, uh, I think is... just that a month later, or... Jeff, I had more money. You know? I know, right? I know. <laughs> Because this, this is the big question, right? So our survey was, was July 2014, yeah. right? Has this gone away? And we talked about this a little bit yesterday here at the round table on the, on the election. You know, I can argue that, well, I think, you know, the, 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 the large turnout and the often enthusiastic turnout for, for Putin in the presidential election is an indicator that this still goes on, right? Um, and if you look at coverage on Russian TV and its emotional content and, and, and you know, that's still going on. I can't tell you that these people that we spoke to in 2014 still feel the same way because I haven't spoken to them since. Um, I would love it if I could. I, my guess is it would be it is the case, but but I don't know. And, and, and there's nobody else doing these that I know of anyway. There's doing this kind of uh, survey research. Uh, most of the survey work is still kind of caught in a in a you know a kind of uh, materialist um, vein, right? They ask some questions about identity. Um, but not much. And we're now getting into, there's changing, people are starting to ask questions about personality types, they're starting to ask questions about emotions, um, but it's, 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 it's a, it's a new-ish thing. It's certainly in, in the study of autocracies. Yeah. I guess part of the reason I'm skeptical is because it seems like this is really just effective propaganda, and I'm not sure what particular quality there, there are in, you know, out of this, you know, what, what future can be predicted like looking at the results of this going forward, what does that even mean? You know, like, oh, you know, where there's rather on the flag effect, but going forward, are you saying that this emotional engagement is going to continue based on the results that you saw from the survey or, you know? So, I mean, predicting what's going on outside of the data is, is, is you know, I can't show you that, that it's continued, right? But I think there's, as I just mentioned, I think in the elections we see evidence that, that, that this phenomena Phenomenon but, there were, but there were other trends. There was and we no see, competition. And we see it in, in Putin's approval rating is still very high. It hasn't really gone down at all um, over this period. Um, there's a debate. I mean, it's a debate. I don't know the answer, right? But but my my sense is that um, that this sort of uh, re uh, formatting of Russian politics away from a materialist basis to a much more emotional to a much more uh, Identity-based set of criteria is 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 real, and it's and it's still there, and and you know I would I don't expect it to go anywhere for, you know. For some time. Well, I mean, like there's this whole debate that was described as a, the TV versus the fridge. Yeah. And where do you see emotions fitting into that? Well, so it's, it's, it's through emotions that the TV wins, right? Even even over the fridge, and and, and had has been winning. Consistently over the fridge for for the last you know three or four years. Okay, so um, this is an argument and that's, and that's for, the for TV in this debate in that particular. Sorry. So in the in the TV versus fridge, you feel that emotions are strengthening the argument for TV being more powerful. So emotions are are the explanation for why the TV is is more powerful. Right. Yeah. Um, well, my question is about the negative emotions. I mean, you are basically focusing on the positive emotions right. in uh, explaining the support of the regime. And um, I've been doing some research in Turkey and doing surveys and interviews, trying to find out the emotional support to the Erdogan's regime in Turkey. Pretty much similar, actually. Oh, Maybe great. You have economic yeah. stagnation 
and uh, declining support to the Erdogan regime, and then after the coup attempt, uh, and this, the, the euphoria that you have been explaining, people joining to the pro-democracy meetings and this and that, then you see the approval rate ratings of Erdogan's regime increasing and this and that. So the question that I have is that, well, when we have done the surveys, uh, we also included the positive emotions in the mm -hmm. survey and negative emotions as well. Mm -hmm. and, but what we, what we found out, and we then did some interviews with some of the participants, hundreds of, hundreds of them, I, I think we did hundreds of interviews, mm -hmm. and hundreds of interviews. So what we found out is, um, we, in, in the beginning it was basically right after like two weeks after the coup attempt, it was basically fear, but not fear from Erdogan, but fear from something is gonna happen to them. Right, because there's a lot of things going on that people do not understand. But six months after, with that intervention and euphoria, what we have uh, found out is that it was transformed into anger. And people uh, felt that, that I mean, felt that anger as a positive emotion. Right? Instead of fear, right. now we have the anger. Right? Yeah. And the anger is now towards the external forces, outsiders, Western, sure. Westerners who are intervening to the Turkish yeah. politics and this and that. And then when we did the interviews, what well, we found out that, I, pe I mean, the people are really externalizing everything. Uh -huh. I mean, you see this emotional attachment and some other theme that came up is really the physical love that they feel, I mean, against our, towards Erdogan. <laughs> They experience, I mean, I love him. And it's really, you know, like a physical lo love, mm -hmm. almost, as you were saying, you know, like all this um, politics of sexuality and this and that. I mean, you can see so that. So now you've got me pitching everyone with his shirt <laughs> off, which I'm not sure and my A day. lot of identification <laughs> with their life, right? Yeah. A lot of crisis is going on. Uh, and you see that, um, you know, like I have a lot of problems in my life and, and I'm encountering a lot of problems similar to Erdogan, similar to my country, and we are identical. Um, so, I mean, I mean, my question is that, what is the negative emotions, how negative emotions play a role in your explanation? Because yeah. it's not really fear from the authoritarian leader, fear from something is going to happen to them, and that authoritarian right. leader really transforms it to something more um, positive. Yeah. And sometimes it's anger. So that, that's really interesting. We, I don't really have data that speak to that directly, mm -hmm. right? So we asked people, um, you know, to what extent did they think participation in politics was dangerous, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the first thing to note was they didn't think it was particularly dangerous. Very few people said they thought it was dangerous. And that number didn't really change much mm -hmm. before and after Crimea. Um, we asked them about anger, because you know, in the literature, anger is, is, a, is, a, is a, it's, it's a mobilizing emotion, right? It's it actually... You know, fear demobilizes you and anger mobilizes. Um, anger is also kind of a personal thing, which is another reason why it's, 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 it's mobilizing. But we asked, we asked about anger towards the regime, towards Putin and the leadership, mm -hmm. rather than towards <coughs> external forces. Mm -hmm. um, the one way that, that I could get at this, this is, this is actually that's a really helpful suggestion, because we also asked them uh, about their, their how they thought of foreigners, the US, Europe, uh, Germany, and China, and, 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 and Syria. Um, whether they thought of them as an, as a, as a, as an ally, as a, as, as a partner, as an enemy. Um, you see an enormous increase in enemy uh, over this time, but I wonder if it was people who, who saw the West as an, as an enemy already, um, whether they're, they're more engaged in this process or not. So that, that's, that's the only way I think Mm -hmm. that we could get at that sort of reversal mm -hmm. um, of fear that you're talking about, but we didn't really address it directly. Mm -hmm. But I'd love, to, I'd love to talk more about what you find in Turkey that way. Yeah. So I have two questions. Uh, one is, do you have any measures of how people view the current economic situation, considering that you do have a measure of future economic position? Yeah. Do, do you have that? Yeah. It might, it might be interesting to see if people's um, economic uh, viewing of how things are right now is skewed. Right. So yes, and they think that things are nice. I was just looking on Google. Apparently, it was like zero point one percent GDP growth at that time. So it wasn't really growing. Things were not good. But if they thought that the economic situation was good, then that is indication that something's happening. Yeah. So that's that's, that's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so basically, you maybe interact that with something, mm -hmm. and that means that your thinking is skewed or biased in some way. 
So if you can interact that variable with something else, then that might be interesting. The second question is, who is actually being affected here? So who is actually changing um, the perceptions? Is this every single person, or is this a small sample of people in the overall sample? So the reason why I ask that is perhaps that there's actually 10 people who are actually having their attitudes changed, um, or it could be every single person. Right, so what we found was, if you go back to the, to the, so like, if like you take just the, I'm going the wrong way. Um, to take hope, for example. Sure. You see, you see, you see a, a shift across the board, right? So there's, there's almost like, um, but is that every single person shifting? It's not every single person, but but but, but there's, there's 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 quite a lot of people. There's a lot of people okay. shifting. It's not just a small number. Okay. But the ones that are most likely to shift are the people who are more, are, are most engaged in in, 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 in the in the moment, right? in the Crimea moment. moment. So the people who are, who are talking about politics more, people who are watching state television news more, um, people who are, are discussing, who are, who are more like interested in politics in general. That's the that's the group that's moving. People who are disengaged from politics are not, they're, they're still disengaged from politics. Okay, okay, interesting. So you go from being you know, engaged but, but critical right. to being engaged but supportive, right? So being basically, by, um, for the people who are not interested in, or who are not watching TV, if you gave them a TV and they sat down from the TV, that effect might not have actually occurred. Right, so that, that's why we do the the, 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 the difference in difference. Yeah. Right. So 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 the, the, yes, the, the, that effect would. The, the evidence is that that that, that would ha have an effect on them, right? So increasing state TV would have that effect, even if they're not watching more, uh, to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was actually also puzzled by the question. Uh, to what degree this is an effect of propaganda versus engagement. So I don't know if you have this data, but it would be interesting to see whether there are any differences between people who actually participated in pro-government rallies mm -hmm. versus those who did not, because we know that people do not necessarily go to pro-government rallies uh, as volunteers. Sometimes they are just brought there. and. Uh, but this makes them actually participate in something related to the activities of the government. So this is like actual engagement in whether that changes their perception in comparison to other people who are just exposed to propaganda. Yeah. Like that would maybe help somehow disentangle the fact of just being exposed to propaganda versus actually participating, being engaged in, in the process. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the propaganda question is interesting, right? So one of the, 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 one of the things we'd like to know is, uh, I'm trying to think through this propaganda question, right? So what, 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 what's the concern here with propaganda? There's a concern here that um, it's somehow what, what you're seeing on TV is not true, and if you were interested in, in politics and interested in uh, the moment and somehow had access to other sources, mm -hmm. the effects would be different, mm -hmm. right? So we can show that people who watch, who, who get, who use live journal for news, um, their effects are, are they're small, but there's a small, smallish group, but the effect of using li a live journal is in the opposite direction from the effects of using state TV. But that's because- so that, that would be in support of propaganda. Well, not, not necessarily, because the people who watch state TV are different from the people who use live journal for news initially, okay. right? So, it's, so it, it's hard to kind of separate out those two, those two effects, right? So the way, the, way the, 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 the interpretation that I put on it, and it's an interpretation, um, is that you're selecting into watching state television, right? Um, the difference in difference evidence also suggests that if you were forced to watch more state television, you know, if you could randomly issue more state television, then that would have an effect too, right? But that's, so that's kind of a more clean, if you want, propaganda effect, maybe, maybe that's, that's the, that is the pure propaganda effect, I'm not sure, right? Um, I'll have 100 drops of pure propaganda, please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 I think, it, I think it, it's hard to untangle what this 
what the worry about this propaganda is. I'm not really certain that I really get it. I'm not sure. So maybe, like, maybe I missed it, sorry. Came in late, but uh, maybe the way to think about this issue is that, are you, are you saying that suppose Crimea didn't happen, suppose Crimea annexation didn't happen, but we keep the propaganda efforts as they, were, as they actually were from 2014, and just replace the mentioning of Crimea in Russian news with something else, right? So that if you still would observe these effects, these would not be Crimea effects, right? These would be effects of the prop, propping up yeah. of the state propaganda. Whereas, yeah. from what I understood from our yesterday's conversation, sorry, I'm just because I missed the talk, but I, I knew a little bit about design. Is that your claim is actually the the Crimea effect, right? Because that's so. Our, our treatment is is you know, essentially our treatment is anything that happens between October 2013 and July 2014. Okay, so then you could say that's the, the time that did, did come up quite severely. That the that propaganda went up, un yes. unquestionably went up in, enormously during that period. The propaganda was about Crimea and what and, and Eastern Ukraine. Yeah. And Olympics and like Pussy Riot. Free. Also, Other also things happened, right? yeah, a bunch of things happened. So, so that I mean, that's in some sense that that's. Yeah, and, and, and there's, there, there's no way from the design that we can unpick that, right? There's, 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 there's this time point and that time point and a bunch of stuff. And we know that people who, are, who, are, who consume more propaganda, more state TV, and people who, are, who talk about politics and who are interested in politics, that they're all much more engaged in all these processes. Um, but I can't say, you know, clearly it's Crimea or it's propaganda or... So I need to be more... more well, what, can you walk us through, the, that, walk us through the, the mechanisms of the argument again? Because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to wrap my head around exactly what's the first analysis that you did where you use the lags. Can you tell us exactly how that analysis works and how it compares to the, the argument? Yeah, so, so essentially the argument is that, that if you're more... Um, uh, that, that, that the more engaged you are in politics, right? the more the better you feel. Yeah, the bigger effect this has on your emotional engagement with the regime. Right. And emotional engagement is feeling pride, feeling happy. Feeling pride, pride trust. So that's a, that's a composite indicator of pride. Right. And that's trust a causal and relationship because what? Which is the causal? The, the, Why the is it a causal relationship? Because the alternative, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how I can do that. The alternative is there's just a bucket of things that happens here, right? You get the invasion of Crimea. Some people like the invasion of Crimea, some people don't like the invasion of Crimea. And that if you do like the invasion of Crimea, you are more supportive of Putin, you're more happy about the way the country is going, you're more all of these things, right? And if you don't like the invasion of Crimea, you're less all of these things, and you might even be less, watch less TV because they're talking about Crimea on the time or everything like that. That it's just like this kind of normal, you're trying to say this isn't just a normal rally around the flag effect. Yeah. You're trying to say there's something different here where people got really emotion. It's not just liking Crimea that drives everything. So how do we know that it's not just a bucket that goes to get that what the regime does something you like, and therefore when you're asked questions about the regime, you're more positive in terms of those answers after the regime did something you like, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people liked Crimea. Yeah. Right. You showed us a bunch of things that after Crimea, lots of things get better. So I'm trying to understand. So what we're why it is, doesn't go policy, the policy shift happens, and then people are just answering a whole bunch of questions more positively about the regime. That seems kind of like Occam's razor, but you have a, a, a so lag design we're, we're, which is supposed to take account of it. Right, so, so the, the, first, the, first, the, 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 the basic argument is that the regime does something you like, right? right. And people who, are, uh, who, who, who get more engaged in politics as, as a result of that, or who were more engaged in politics before, those are the groups of people who experience all of these uh, emotional effects and experience these much broader senses of well-being than just a, a rally, right? So it's not just about approval. So one, one of the arguments is... But it's both people who were more engaged beforehand That's what, that's what the two different people. analyses show, right? So the, 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 the static score, the lagged analysis, right? So this, this, is, this is a cross lag regression, right? And we take uh, the... Um, how much people uh, watch state TV before Crimea, how much how interested they are in politics before Crimea, right? how much they, they talk about politics with their friends before Crimea, right? And after Crimea, what happens to their uh, emotions, right? their emotional engagement, right? And so on all of these people, all these indicators, people who did this stuff more before Crimea 
get more engaged. Right? They, 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 sorry, they, they, they have an increase in their emotional attachment to the regime. Right? The problem you might think with that, that so the y-axis is how much you like the regime. Th th this is the, the index of emotional engagement. And you lag that as well. Uh, so there's, there, that, there's a lag of that in, 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 in the regression. Yeah. So this is controlling for how you felt about the regime before, how much TV you watched, how interested you are, how much you talked, increases your effect, your, your affect in the second stage. So the upper left-hand corner, there, there's no way we can dismiss the propaganda story. No. That's like a perfect example of the propaganda yeah. story. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, like, it, it's not clear to me that, so the, the propaganda story is, you know, and, I mean, my alternative explanation is like people who don't like the Crimea thing and everyone's talking about how great Crimea is, uh -huh. they get less interested in politics and they get less, and they get less, uh, they talk about politics less, right? And so then you're controlling for how engaged they were before, but even controlling for how engaged they were before, they're going to be less supportive of the regime because they don't like what happened with Crimea. Although people who don't like Crimea would not watch state TV, but they would still be talking about politics. I, I, I mean, it's, hard, it, it's hard to imagine people stopping talking about politics. But yeah, we're breaking down sure. people into people who, but the, the, I guess I'm just finding these graphs confusing. The SD below and SD above is in terms of how much political discussion they have in time two. No, no, no. So you're not, so, so you go, you go like take time, take these two analyses separately, right? Let's talk you through, through this one again. This is the, what's called a static score model. Right? So that's basically you lag all of your independent variables. You, know, you, lag, you take the first run for all of your independent variables, right? including a lag dependent variable. Right? And the outcome is the, is the emotions index in the second run. Right? So people who already watch more state TV, so this is somebody who watches less state TV than the, than, than the mean. And this is somebody who in October is watching more state TV than the mean. Right? The people who are watching more state TV than the mean in October are more engaged afterwards, right? And more engaged in July. Right? And the reason you do this is because you want to separate out the, the, the kind of the, instant, the simultaneous effect, right? So, so it, it can't be that Crimea makes you watch more state TV in, in October, right? Right? That's the point of this analysis. The problem with this analysis, or the complaint about this analysis, is say, well, this is not independent, right? This 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 is caused by or which one of these you are is caused by your support for the regime. Anyway, your attitude towards the regime, which is going to be correlated with the, with the outcome. So then what you want to do then is but, the, but the yeah, second stage, which is the, which is the, the individual group level fixed effects model. And what this is showing is basically, this is a difference in difference model. Right? So this is, this is the change. So people who are watching more state TV, who increase the amount of these follow politics, increase the amount of discuss politics, or whose his family and economic situation gets better, they all experience this increase in emotional engagement. Right? Now what we really want to do is, is go back, or one thing we might want to do is go back to the static score model, right? And have a, you know, identify a variable that's not correlated with, you know, it's correlated with, with watching TV, but not, you know, that not correlated with, 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 with your uh, uh, assessment of the regime, right? Um, but we haven't, I, 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 we haven't got, you know, instrumental variables that, that work very well for that, right? So we're, we're kind of stuck with having these two different analyses, both of which show the same thing, but both of which show different things, both of which are consistent with the story. Does that make sense? A little, so a little bit more. A little bit more. But I mean, go, the first analysis, mm -hmm. go to the next slide, right? So that upper left-hand corner, that's the propaganda. That's if you were w more prone to watch TV, originally you feel better, but we don't know if that's selection bias, right? Right. The people who like the regime. But you, Dennis, you were saying like discussion and interest, you don't think that should be correlated with liking the regime. People should be just as likely to discuss politics in October who dislike. So what, what I need to do is I need to show I need a table that shows the relationship between basically these variables and support for the regime and uh, conditional on all the observables before, right? So I need to I need to I, I could actually show I don't know the answer to this, right? I haven't looked at it, but I don't know if political discussion is correlated with support for the regime before, right? 
or if, if, if interest. So if you're right, then, then that, 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 that would be helpful right, to show that at this stage. Right? We're sure that this is, state TV is correlated with support for the regime. Right, so if you just, I mean, because if you just put support for the regime up there, then get me a, tell me stop if I'm wrong. But then all that graph would be showing for us is that people who like the regime more in the beginning, they're, they like the regime more after Crimea as well on your index of yeah. other things measuring how much they like the regime. But not just like the regime more, they, 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 they shift from, they, they develop this emotional attachment to the regime. They feel more pride. So it's not, and that, and that, that chart and that has an effect on its own. I thought that chart just shows that people who watch more TV feel more pride after Crimea than people who watch less TV prior yeah. to Crimea. So if all pri watching TV is proxy for is how much you like the regime, you just said after Crimea, the people who... So that's why we do the difference in difference. Right. Because in this, that's not the problem. That's not, that's not, that's not an issue. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about methodology as in how did you identify the people that did the survey? How did you reach out to them? Sure, sure. So this is a this is a marketing panel, right? So we, we, we worked through a, a big marketing company in Moscow. Um, we basically have a panel of, of 350,000 people that they pay every month a small amount of money to be on their email list, essentially. And they respond to surveys. They have to respond to a certain number of surveys a month. Um, and so we emailed everybody this survey. We're interested in your views on, on politics. We asked them a bunch of things. Um, and they took the survey. And, and, and we kept allowing people to take the survey until we had got to the, the number that we had paid for, right, essentially. Um, but but, but uh, post gratified on, on, on uh, gender and age. Okay. So these are all people who are online, right, right by definition. Um, uh, and we, we, we threw out people who said, who didn't have, said they didn't have enough money for, for, for food or clothing, right? So we wanted to get some kind of, you know, at least kind of basic uh, middle class uh, income. We, uh, we also, we uh, threw out people who didn't have uh, at least some further education, right? Because we were interested not in a, re in a representative sample uh, of urbanites, but we were, what we were interested in was um, this, this sparks, right? People who were in this, this, this sort of kind of educated urbanite group. Uh, and the reason we did that was because, because A, because they were um, the group that was kind of the main political playing field uh, in, 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 in 2011, 2012. Um, we thought that politically this was actually a much more consequential group um, than a sort of you know, random sample of, 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 of Russians. Um, and also because it gave us a, a larger number, at least initially, it gave us a larger number of regime opponents. So we could actually get some meaningful data on what regime opponents actually look like. Um, of course, after Crimea, that changes and, and they don't really look all that different from, from everybody else. And did you inform respondents ahead of time that it's going to be a story of politics? So did um, no. So they, we started off. We actually started off with personality questions, um, and then we asked we asked you know questions about. Uh, uh, we, then we started about. Then we asked the approval questions straight after that, and then we went right into politics. Um, but yeah, it begins with a you know kind of a, 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 a ten uh, question personality inventory. Yeah. I mean, this is not just about Turkey right now, but. Uh, a little bit about the literature on populism. So the literature says that you have almost like a free group of people um, when you're researching, you know, uh, the, the attitudes towards the populist leaders. Uh, one, some, I mean, one third of the population, 20 person, 30 person, I'm really overgeneralizing right now. But what I'm trying to say is that they do seem to have, this, this part of the population seem to have kind of an anti-dude or an immunity towards the leader. They don't watch state TV. They right. don't. They will never ever vote for the populist leader or the authoritarian leader, whatever happens to the crime or or a coup attempt or this and that. So it, it really, I mean, their prior political um, attitudes really determines the, their attitudes towards the populist leader. And mm -hmm. you have the people 
who really in the, in the early stages of the populist or the authoritarian leader identifies with the leader and they don't change their voting behavior. Right. And you have the people in the middle, like 30% or 40% of the people who are not sure. Sometimes yeah. vote for this person, and sometimes not, and this and that. And the populism literature and Miller and all these other people says that um, the crisis situations actually appeals to those people, to those who are in the middle, yeah, who are not really sure about what to think about the, uh, about the leader, about Putin, Erdogan, Orban, and this and that. They feel kind of a catharsis and identification with the leader, and they have they think that they have to support the leader in this situation of crisis. Mm -hmm. But once the euphoria goes away, you know, in, in two years, in a year, and what we found in the case of Turkey, euphoria stays there in the first year, then it starts to go away. And it's pretty much related to then it's the the, 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 um, the support to the leader is pretty much related to um, there are no other alternatives. That's what they're saying. Okay, we voted for this person. We are going to vote for, for this person again. Um, why not, mm -hmm. right? But they do not have these positive emotions anymore after a so year. So they're away so. after a year. Yeah. Interesting. And this is kind of you know like the competitive authoritarianism literature says like Berger and this and all the other people like if you don't have you if you have economic crisis and stagnation economic stagnation but you don't have another alter any other alternative credible mm -hmm. alternative so it really doesn't matter whether you have mm -hmm. uh, economic crisis stagnation yeah. or this and that so I wonder you know. Um, whether you know, like these people in the middle, how it plays into this survey, and whether you, it's possible to identify who's these people who are immune to Putin, who would never watch state TV, uh, or who are in the middle. What are their characters? So that, that group, we have a group like that, but they're but they're small. It's about ten percent mm -hmm. of the you know the kind of the, the, the immune ones, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, the the characteristic of of of, of, of them is. Uh, is basically like the, the, the one factor that distinguishes them out from the rest mm -hmm. um, is personality traits and, and they're essentially um, people who are uh, very low on agreeableness right so they're, 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 they don't mind about pissing other people off essentially they don't care what other people think of them um, and who are high on neuroticism right so they're, they're uncomfortable and they're nervous and they're, they're anxious right now the neuroticism thing Oh, yeah, so the neuroticism thing might be because they're not supporters of the regime that they feel more yeah. neurotic. It's actually one of, one of the big five personality traits. Are there non Jews it's there? The one that they're <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's that's been said before. <laughs> so that's 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 the one of the traits that 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 seems to vary over people's lifetime. Their agreeableness doesn't vary much at all over people's lifetime. Kids who are, you can identify agreeable people at three, and they remain cursed with agreeableness for the rest of their life. Um, and uh, highly agreeable people are the real st stalwarts of the regime, like all the way through uh, this process, and they support all sorts of things. And so, for example, um, in the West, highly agreeable people are um, are much more tolerant and liberal. Uh, and in in, in 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 Russia, highly agreeable people are, are uh, more supportive of laws against offending Orthodox believers. They're more supportive of, of chasing out immigrants. The more, the more support of anti-gay uh, legislation, homophobic le legislation. So things that they wouldn't be associated with in the West, but because that's what they're told is normal, right? That's they're told what the social standard is. So those are the, those are the, the characteristics that are pretty good at predicting um, those kind of, you know, the, the, the different camps. Um, that's, a, that's a different paper that we wrote about that. Um, uh, yeah. So our tourism yeah. is going to try to so I just wondered about like more b bigger sort of theoretical question here. So because if the claim is that there are periods of time, there are moments of history where emotional attachment to regime is just empirically important, I think that no one would disagree that those moments might exist, and you probably are finding one of those moments, yeah. right? If we could give you data, but I, I'm not sure how to think about it beyond this particular empirical fact. In other words, if I would like to think, okay. What would be the features of the environment under which the switch occurs? Is this sort of the critical junctures argument that there is something random that happens in history and for reasons that we cannot predict, you, you know, the regime is able to turn on the emotional switch? Mm -hmm. 
So in other words, what would be like an ex ante expectation, right, as to how, like, why isn't it universal? Like, why does it matter, right? Why didn't we see the same thing in 2008, for example, right? Uh, I'm just sort of thinking, like, how to, how to build on this and just go beyond like a, an establishment of an empirical fact and sort of think about like if it is really part of the how you say you know contemporary regimes build support for these emotions and well why isn't it universal why did you have to have Crimea in order to have this thing right so I'm just wondering what, mm -hmm. you know, what are your thoughts on this that's a really really good question and I don't have a proper answer for that yet um, uh, I think this is also related to some of the things we've been asking but so I, I, I think I think that the the direction of the answer um, is, is, is the global financial crisis, right, in 2008. Um, and the implications of that running through, because I think this sort of this emotional turn in politics and, uh, and the kind of the disconnect between economics and politics, it's not just been going on in Russia, right? I think it's been going on in the United States, it's been going on in Britain, it's been going on in all sorts of places. And I think that sort of the, there's something about the consequences of the global financial crisis that create the opportunity for this kind of uh, process to take place, right? Um, so, it, you know, to kind of take it out of that, uh, put it more theoretically, then it would be something about economic uncertainty, economic crises, um, that one of the implications of economic crises is the opening up of the space for uh, a politics based on emotion and identity. Um, and you know a reduction of the extent to which politics is, should be understood in a materialist way. Um, that's you know with this kind of data, obviously that's untestable, right? Um, yeah, well, you probably want to think about like more like extended systemic crises as opposed to long, you know, right. short-term shocks, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that is sort of does sound like critical junctures type of thing, like something big happens, right? We don't know exactly. We cannot predict that thing in science, but like condition on that thing happening, that's when you expect to see politicians being able to turn on this, which so that's why I think like it's kind of I see why he has a problem of like propaganda versus the actual event because mm -hmm. probably it, if Crimea didn't exist, the idea is right, like if Crimea didn't exist, there is only that much that propaganda can achieve, but with Crimea probably the ceiling gets raised, right? That's that's the way I would sort of think about this. But, so people but have the survey to, tested before and after Crimea, so it, it happened. Like if it would have tested without Crimea, yeah, then yeah, we would have known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so inferentially, he had, I don't think inferentially he can nail this down with this, but it's just right. impossible because two things happened at the same time. Right. Yeah. yeah. But we can still think theoretically, like, and I think theoretically his argument is that the way I understand it, that propaganda alone wouldn't be able to achieve that, that effect, right? if there are no objective conditions that make people specific, especially susceptible, right? And maybe a way, right. but it's still important, right, to, to, to build a coherent theoretical statement, right? The, the question whether it's right, you know, maybe one can gather additional data from other environments to test it, right? I can't answer that. I mean, to me, it seems that it's not proven. Right, in this particular design, I, I agree with you. I don't right. think it's proven that, that this is the way it works, yes. Yeah. But this kind of, I think this kind of circles back a little bit to the question I was trying to get at before. Maybe it's this critical juncture, right? Like, is it, I mean, what, what worries me about the analysis is still that there's a win, that something happens, and a lot of the population like the thing that happens. And then a bunch of these things follow from the fact that they like. So imagine just for a second, that this was, instead of this was being about, um, this is about Crimea taking place, this is about the Mets opening their season 10 and 1, right? And so all of a sudden, you have a bunch of people who are really happy about the fact that they're winning a lot of games. And so you ask them a whole bunch of questions about, do you feel hopeful about the future for the team? Yes. Do you feel a sense of pride in the team? Yes. Mm -hmm. But at the same respect, because they're winning a bunch of games, and this is true for me, definitely, I'm going to turn the TV on more to try to see ESPN highlights because they're winning a lot. I'm going to follow the team more intensely and read a bunch of articles about them. And I'm going to talk about it at like seminars more intensely, right? Even in times when I probably shouldn't be talking about it. Mm -hmm. All those things, those things would work with the individual level fixed effects because at the individual level, at lots of individuals, 
there'd be the people who don't like the Mets, there'd be no change in any of those things. And the people who do like them are going to go up in terms of your dependent variable, and you're going to go up in terms of your independent variable. So as best I can understand, an individual fixed effects model, which is all you're picking up is the variation in individuals, you're going to get exactly these results. That there's more state TV thing being and associated with more pride, but both those things, watching more state TV and feeling more prideful, are being driven by this critical juncture where you do this thing that's really popular with a bunch of people, and it drives all of these things. And so the attempt to so I guess I just all, the whole thing that I'm worried about, it's not that I'm doubting that any of this is happening, and the, and but we get that out of the the bar charts you showed us in the beginning, which are incredibly convincing. What I'm wondering is, is you're trying to make an argument that it's, it's what's happening here is people are reorienting around emotions, and and my alternative story is no, they just did a really popular policy, and you're finding things on both the right hand side and the left hand sides of your variables that are going to go up, even within individuals over this time period because this really popular policy happened, not because people are more emotionally resonating. Politics has become more about an emotional resonance. It's just that you're doing it. that's that's my concern, and I and I've tried to say it for your four different ways. And sure. I might still be well, so that's that's where the mediation analysis yeah. comes in, right? So what we're what we're showing in that is is that you basically you you regress the change in emotions on on on, on your independent variables, right? And then you uh, look for your, your your second set of dependent variables, your 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 your, your well-being, and you parse out which effects go through the increase in emotions and which right. are which are still there once you once you once you control for that that, that, that emotional factor and what we're what we should put that mediation analysis shows is that um, that, that, that state TV and interest and non discussion all of those things work through emotions through their effect on emotions there's no direct effect or very few direct effects of those okay, on so if I was perceptions to, of high level corruption, perceptions of low level of the future. So I guess what I'd like to hear is if I'm right, uh -huh. and that there's not an independent causal effect for emotions on these perceptions about the regime, that this is all being driven by an omitted variable, which is whether you approve of the action to re-annex Crimea, and that that's driving the better, higher emotions, and that's driving these you know, better feelings about the regime, what would these mediation effects look like? If that was what was the state of the world, would they? How would they look different from what we see here? So, you, so you're saying there's an admitted variable that we haven't controlled for, and that that's that's driving everything else. If if if, if we've admitted it, and it's you know this this is. I'm just saying. If, I guess I, I don't know. I feel like I'm trying to ask. I don't know. It's probably too. But like, if all that's happening here is a bundle of things, if if what you are doing is actually just picking, there's something called rally around the flag or critical juncture. Something happens. A huge portion of the regime, the the state does something that's really popular with the regime, uh -huh. with a huge portion of the population, and you survey people before and after they do that really popular thing, right? And so, is there a bundle of survey questions that people will give you better answers to after the regime has done something really popular? And and you're saying no. The mediation analysis shows that that story is not correct. That no, actually, saying that, that that story is correct, right? But the way that it works. Is through it's the increase in affect, right? Which mediates the, these these views on these other things, right? So you wouldn't get just by watching state TV, you wouldn't get you know an increase in um, your uh, view on, of 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 high level improvement in your view of high level corruption. Right? Watching state TV alone does not do that for you. What watching state TV does for you is increases your emotional attachment to the regime, and that improves your view of high level of corruption. Right. So that's the that's the, the in other words the state TV effect on these other well being experiences goes away once you account for right. the state TV effect on emotions and the effect of emotions on well being. That's all. Right? We're not saying that there might I can't say that there's something we didn't measure. Right. Right. So, in the, the difference in difference model, what I allows you to say is, well, because you have an individual level fixed effect, that's in the fixed effect, right? And we still find, you know, that TV matters, that talking matters, and the interest matters. In change, that, so changes in those affect your change in engagement. Right? Those all matter, even if there is some unmeasured your variable out there, right? That we can't do with these because these are not. This is not a difference in difference. Right. Uh, Okay, this is a I've tried to ask for it. I haven't asked 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 for it. I ha
What about like other possibilities? Is there something in psychology literature that would allow you to identify people with traits who are not really emotionally very perceptive, like very low emotional intelligence? And so those people, if your theory is right, those people's attitudes shouldn't have been affected because their emotions couldn't have been affected. Like is there some, I'm just hmm. thinking about sort of like a placebo group to your story, right? So in other words, if it is through emotions, then if you could think about like traits of people that are hard, whose emotions are hard to, to like I'm, I'm thinking about my dad, I don't know what's expressing, <laughs> whose emotions are hard to affect, right? So then they should, their attitudes shouldn't have been affected either, either right? So. Uh huh. So even even if they watch more state TV, right? It wouldn't because get if, if your story is true, right? This is through emotions, right? That's yeah. That's a challenge. Some kind of developmentally challenged individuals. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> they're, 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 they're developmentally very successful individuals who, whose emotions are hard are hard to change. So yeah. So this could be people like this could be people who are like low on emotionality, low on low on neuroticism. We have some data on that. Uh -huh. Um. That's, a, that's an interesting idea. Um, what's, what's, so the, 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 the personality type that actually works, that I didn't talk about it today, but that, that, that works with the Crimea effect is, is um, uh, people who uh, are, um, uh, how was the term? Basically, basically if, you, if you're up for adventures, uh, then you're like Crimea. Right? Um, if, you're, if you're not up for, for, for adventures, then, then you know, then you don't it's like, like gambling. Yeah, 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 people who like to... So no, it, it, it's uh, extroversion, extroversion. So people who are extroverts, like, like, like Crimea. Um, uh, well, interestingly, openness to experience doesn't do anything for you in Russian politics, at least according to our data. It's, 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 it really doesn't do very much, because it should, it, in, 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 in democracies, that's the big variable, right? Openness to experience is, your, is basically your liberalism uh, variable, and that does very, very little for you in, 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 in the Russian context. Um, it's all about uh, conscientiousness, which is a conservative variable in the West and works just as just exactly the same in Russia. And then agreeableness, which you know, is, is huge. It's probably the most important one, and it acts in the opposite way in Russia from what Honestly, you Honestly, that seems like the most interesting thing that I'm taking away from this is the, the difference between the agreeable <laughs> and agreeable in West and, and Russia, uh -huh. where you have this kind of a flip. Mm -hmm. That that to me is really eye-opening. So Green and Robertson, CPS, 2016. It's That's awesome. I think one thing, that maybe one thing that's going on in this discussion is that like there's there are a bunch of models out there that are you know pinning down some interesting micro-level relationships that we can look at and think. And then there's this larger claim that the nature of politics flipped right. and people became more emotional. And like, I, I think part of the confusion is getting caught up in like whether the micro-level evidence that you're showing, you're like, I'll totally buy, like State TV works through emotions. But like, would State TV have worked through emotions from 2012 to 2013? Yeah, probably, I don't know. Why would, you know, why would I not expect you know, like, what, would that have been the same thing in 1998? I, yeah, I mean, I mean so, so what we have is, we, the, the, I guess what's the, this comes back to the, to the, the issue of what the treatment if it is, right? And I think this is really important and I, and I haven't addressed it uh, enough, which is that the treatment here, it's not Crimea so much, although, it, I mean, it, it's not only Crimea. It's this big increase in the, con in, in the, in the news content on TV and the change in the nature of that news content. And, and, and the kind of the much more emotional uh, style that was developed. Now this had been, I mean, Arturus and I were talking about this, just this had already been started before Crimea, but Crimea is when it really goes into, you know. Yeah, we were talking about this at conferences, on steroids, RTs right? type stuff. I mean, because that's what would be really interesting here to see is like, you know, if, if the, that would be a general theory, right? Like yeah. when you increase the emotional content of state TV, then state TV's effects on your approval of the regime and these other things will be mediated more yeah. through emotions, right? Like, and then you could actually measure the emotional content over multiple years and run these, if you've got a bunch of these different surveys on this panel, you could run it on different periods of time. Mm -hmm. But again, that's a different claim than like people became more emotional about politics. And I mean, because I guess what you're sort of saying is the state well, TV the thing is here, since the state TV is feeding you facts about that are pro the regime, you know, we would expect there to be direct effects. 
which there are on approval. There's still on approval and, and, and low level right, corruption. Yeah. Actually, there's approved. There's direct effects on more things, but there's not direct effects. So, me too. <laughs> Some of the literature says that it's not really, you know, like uh, emotions from below, but what, what has changed in politics is that now the politicians use emotions more. Right. You know, like they activate emotions in the population and they didn't use to, I mean, it wasn't there that much anymore. And if, you know, like in, Ru in the Russian case, if they activate hope and, you know, this and that, and in the Turkish case, it could be anger and fear, so maybe you know. If, if, if sure, but but, you know, but like to sort of think about, if, about about citizens as being you know uh -huh. just kind of the and politician can come and push a button yeah. and turn emotions yeah, on or right. off, right? I think that people vary in the extent to which you can do that, right? And what's clear is that there are people who are who are into this thing, uh -huh. and it's them that get all worked up. So it, it really is like your Mets fan, right? Um, uh, and people who are not into this thing don't get so worked up, right? And and so maybe, maybe I mean maybe that's not that. That interesting. I think I think I think it is because I think it unpacks this rally story, which which is a fairly kind of one one dimensional thing, and shows that you know this is a much much deeper process, right? There's a lot more going things going on than just approval ratings, and there's a lot more going on than just you know uh, you know we're, we're we're kind of patriotically kind of on on, on this one page. Actually, like we're, we're we're experiencing something that's that's about pride and it's about hope and it's about trust and it's about you know, the perceptions of the future, and it's about perceptions of the past, it's about a lot of things. Um, and, I mean, if you're not surprised all those things go together, then, you know, when, then, okay, right? But, but I, I, think it's, I think it's important that they all go together, and I think it's important, especially in this context of uh, a regime that had, for years, the story was about economic approval, right? And here we have this context in which the economy is going to hell, Crimea is clearly not uh, good for the Russian economy, and no one, no one thinks that uh, for a second. Even Russian TV doesn't think that. There's stories on Russian TV about the costs, um, and yet people still end up with this kind of you know boost to their to, the, to their percept their economic perceptions. I mean, I think I think that's important, and I think it's it's evidence of a change in the basis of politics. It's not proof that politics has changed. It's not proof that politics has changed forever. Right? I don't. I just don't have the kind of data that could show you that. Right? But, but, but the kind of data I have, I show you that in this time period, that's what's going on. Right. But you're sort of couching it in this larger, you know, rise of the right populism that something is happening at this moment in time. And I'm just, I, I'm just really curious to see, like, no, is this just normal rally around the flag effect? If you went back and had all these questions in 1991 in the United States, would these results look exactly yeah, the same? I don't know. Because we're not going to say that in the aftermath that the basis of politics fundamentally changes. I mean, that's followed six, you know, 12 months later by it's the economy stupid. So maybe you're just picking up that this is a pride moment, that there are things that happen that are pride moments, yeah. which is really, which is also a contribution, that yeah. like this yeah, bundle yeah. of events, but it's a slightly different story from the one that you've pitched us as. So, so what I need to do is, is provide other pieces of evidence from other places that, that fit this, the, the, the bigger claim. Right, to, to generate a story to our, our, what our tourists were saying about what's your broader theoretical story here, what's the conditions under which um, this kind of, the, the, the opportunity is open for the emotionalizing, if you like, uh, of, 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 of politics. Or, and you know, it could be that it's just you know, boring old international crisis, and once boring old international crisis is over, we're back to square one. Which is sort of your interpretation of the Turkish data, right, or domestic crisis, actually. Right? Mm -hmm. um, or it could be what I'm trying to claim it is, which is no, actually, this is connected to a broader set of processes that are, that are happening in the West as well, that are to do with the, um, you know, the, 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 the systemic crisis, the crisis of the economy and the crisis of democracy that's followed from um, the international economic crisis of, of the late 2000s. And so that's a case for, for the book I'm going to have to make qualitatively. Um, and so that's really helpful to, to, to understand. Yeah. I have another question about surveys. So were you doing the surveys and then Crimea happened? Were uh, you lucky? So we, no, we did the survey first and then we made Crimea happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should see the IRB. It's <laughs> really <laughs> complicated. It was really exciting. <laughs> Those little green men, man, they're pricey. Uh, yes. We, we, did, we, we did the survey. Is it uh, Robertson, Green, and New One? From me, it happened. Um, and then we took money that was supposed to be used for field work uh, and then bought another survey. 
essentially. Yeah. Um, we did another survey uh, on uh, for for the Moscow mayoral election. So 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 back in in in. in uh, was it, was it 2012, 2013? Um, and uh, right in the middle of our survey, Navalny got sentenced to, 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 to five years in, 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 in prison. Um, and so what we were able to see was that essentially being sentenced to prison in Russia get, buys you 10% increase in your popularity, <laughs> um, which doesn't seem worth it to me. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's the street cred. Yeah, and, it, and it, you know, and there's there's other evidence that some friends of mine were doing like weekly surveys to suggest that that boost lasted about two weeks, which is really not worth it. Um, but yeah, getting lucky is the most important part of political science. I think. All right, I recommend you do that for your dissertation. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, on that note, we're already 15 minutes over because it's been such an interesting discussion. But Graham, thanks so much.